Come to Dust by Ursula McGuinn. Ursula K. Le Guin, sorry. Ursula. Spirit, rehearse the journeys of the body that are to come, the motions of the matter that held you. Rise up in the smoke of Palo Santo. Fall to the earth in the falling rain. Sink in, sink down to the furthest roots. Mount slowly in the rising sap to the branches, the crown, the leaf tips. Come down to earth as leaves in autumn to lie in the patient rot of winter. Rise again in spring's green fountains. Drift in sunlight with the sacred pollen to fall in blessing. All earth's dust has been life. Held soul is holy. Thank you, Laura. And the words to Ursula Le Guin's poem are in the chat for everyone. All earth's dust has been life, held soul, been holy. Friends and members of the Common Street community. Some of you know me. I'm Reverend Claire MacDonald, and I'm joining you from London today. So it's afternoon my time to your morning. And some of you know that I've been coming along on Zoom for the past couple of years. And today, what I'm going to do is to share some thoughts with you about spirituality beyond our inherited faiths, what I'm calling our spiritual commons. A spirituality that draws on our deep connectedness to all that we share the earth with. And Laura's meditation and actually everything that's happened so far, including the breakout group that I was in, is just very much, um, very much in the spirit of all of that. So I'm asking, what do we hold in common materially as a human species and spiritually? And what do we feel about how we share the earth with other species? Do we live in an intelligent world? Do trees communicate with us? Does the land feel or at least react or respond to us? And does all of that make a difference? Is our spirituality connected to the earth we inhabit in deeper ways than we recently imagined? ways that go back to our ancestors and might go forward to the deep future of our descendants. In the last several years, and certainly in this community, there's been a lot of interest in the idea that the natural resources we share have a spiritual aspect, and one that indigenous peoples have known and that are familiar to us through their stories Stories in which rivers and mountains and birds and animals speak. And those stories say that our spiritual life is rooted in the common elements of the world that we share and that we are all made from. All Earth's dust has been life, as Ursula Le Guin says. It's where sacred meets the social, if you like. It says that our spirituality is not separate from the world, but embedded in it that the world is animated and alive and that we're not really in control of it or shouldn't be, but are part of it. And that seeing ourselves as participants in a world of many beings calls us to think differently about our behavior. And it might also be a call to think differently about religion. So I want to begin with really a, a story which I'm going to tell you a quick one and and it's told in this book some of you may know by David Abram um, called The Spell of the Sensuous and he's from Massachusetts actually and he's an interesting guy because he was a child magician a sleight of hand magician and he then became an anthropologist and he spent a lot of time with 
indigenous communities in various parts of the world, including in Bali and in South America. And he relates a story in which he is alone one day. He has lots of stories about rain and rivers and his feelings about the natural world. But one day he's alone out in the wild and he, as well as being alone out in the wild, he's practicing some sleight of hand magic. He's practicing a silver coin that rolls over and over his hand and he, he, you know, he, he hides it, all the kinds of things that we see magicians do. And as he's rolling this silver coin in his hand, a condor flies over and the condor sees the flick of the silver. And when he puts the coin away, the condor starts to lift. And when he takes out the coin, it starts to come nearer and it comes nearer and nearer and nearer. And if I can find it, um, yeah, he said that the coin continued to roll along his fingers and the creature grew louder, grew um, larger and larger until it hovered just above my head. Huge wing feathers rustling ever so slightly as they mastered the breeze. My fingers were frozen, unable to move. The coin dropped out of my hand. And then I felt myself stripped naked by an alien gaze infinitely more lucid and precise than my own. And I don't know how long I was transfixed, only that I felt the air streaming past naked knees and heard the wind whispering in my feathers long after the visitor had departed. His experience then and in other ways asks him to rethink his relationship with everything, including trees and rocks and rivers, and think again in the words of Ursula Le Guin's poem, all earth's dust has been life, has held soul, been holy, and still is. So he's not even just thinking that the other beings we encounter have a sense of spirit and presence, but that everything does, whatever it is. The condor is one extraordinary example, but the rivers and the rain are others. And he says that all our communications, just language itself, how we began to make sounds as early humans, how we touch, how we make gestures, what we point to, began with what was around us the voices of rivers and rain. And noticing the world helped us to build language and culture. And so we're not born to dominate this world. You know, we often think of it as rising on two legs. I mean, history, not even history, but a certain sort of um, way of thinking about the world says that, you know, we became human by killing our prey, by rising on two legs and becoming red in tooth and claw. And he thinks instead, along with other people, that we emerged in cooperative communication with what's around us, with what it is that has held life, has soul, is holy. And holiness, as we heard Laura say from these words by a Unitarian minister, Maureen Kaloran, the ordinary holiness is merely the ordinary held up to the light and profoundly seen. That sense that nothing is lost, that we are all connected. That is our spiritual commons. What it is that we inherit, what we were born into just by being here, by being human. And David Abraham, unsurprisingly, began to notice that the indigenous peoples with whom he was living were connected to the world and took part in it in ways that their care for the environment wasn't a task list, an urgent task list, as it often is for us about the world ending, about climate change, but much more of a sacred duty to a living earth that is our home. And in those belief systems, he said, we don't go anywhere else after we die. We pass into dust, into the air, into the rock, and so we are still here, if you like. And that's one of his explanations for what people often think of as ancestor worship, that there's a sense in which we merely pass into everything that is around us. I did my theology degree, degree with Jesuits. Um, I did it in all of the Abrahamic faiths, but they used to say that if there is any afterlife, it is 
to be printed on the memory of God. And I take that to be very much the same kind of thing. It simply means we don't go away. We are, if you like, stardust. We were all made from what was here at the very beginning. And in the end, we will all become part of the dust which remains in the universe. We printed on the memory of that thing which is bigger than all of us. Another book I'd been reading about this is this other wonderful book by um, Christiana Z. Peppard, which is called Just Water. And it's her wonderful book about the ecology of water and water justice. She's a Catholic, and it's very much about Catholic teaching. And she has this lovely thing that she says, we are porous as human beings, because we mediate the world around us through breathing, through drinking, and eating, and finally through dying, in which we are returned to water, to air, or to earth. And our notion of the sacred in future might has been, might be what it has been, has been, if you like, in the past. It might be located in a renewed understanding that all we hold sacred and all we do to honor the sacred is always drawn from what we have in front of us, from what's made around us, from all the elements that we have. And the symbols we have for the things that we hold sacred are tools, soft tools, and they simply give us the capacity to make and remake what we have. It's in our hands. And that might just <laughs> help to shape a new kind of theology. This is kind of where I'm going and where I'm thinking. And I think some of you might be with me too. Beyond our old faith allegiances, whatever they are, and respecting them, we're not dismissing them but towards a new kind of vision of the sacred, because we have permission to do it simply, again, by being here. It is in our hands. I'm going to end this first part of my talk here by inviting all of you to a moment of reflection. And then we'll hear a very short poem by Wendell Berry, and I'll do the second part. And I'm inviting you to this moment of reflection. It's going to be, I think, three minutes. And it's why Laura invited everyone to bring a pencil and paper at this point. Um, because I'd like you to reflect, and you don't have to write it down, but you might want to, about whether you've ever had a moment, either with another creature or in a place, in which you have felt a kind of living presence, if you like, something that was bigger than you, that you would say amounted to some sort of consciousness. And as I started to write this yesterday, I was thinking that right at the moment here, I guess everywhere in, in the Northern Hemisphere, it's a, the first really big full moon of the summer. And it's often called the strawberry moon because strawberries are at this time of year, and this moon is called the strawberry moon. It's going to be very big, and I think it's going to be biggest, not tonight, but Tuesday. Um, and uh, it's something I often feel with the moon. I don't know about you. I felt very, very clearly at times that the moon itself has a presence and that um, I'm in the presence almost of something that feels as if it's you know, has a kind of spirit associated with it. And also I'm thinking back to David Abrams' Condor moment as well, where he's in the presence of something which is really looking at him and really thinking about him. So I want to invite you to settle back, switch off your, um, uh, your uh, turn to mute if you like, and just spend three minutes just thinking about whether you have had one of those moments and what it might have meant to you. Sometimes they're quite threshold moments. They, they kind of change us. And I guess it's also related a little bit to what Laura said about special places we go. So I invite you to settle back and to take yourself back in your mind or raise in your own mind whether you have had a special moment of recognition with another being that's non-human. 
And we're going to uh, invite you to bring that, if you like, to the community when we have our moments of sharing the wisdom. So let's, Laura, could you, um, could you time three minutes? Yeah, that would be super. Thank you, Laura. I'd like to invite Ian to read the Wendell Berry poem, which I've also put into the chat. Be Still in Haste by Wendell Berry. How quietly I begin again. From this moment, looking at the clock, I start over. So much time has passed and is equaled by whatever split second is present. From this moment, this moment is the first. Thank you, Ian. From this moment, this moment is the first. 
that sense that Wendell Berry has that the moment we have is what we have all the time. That moment of thinking about recognition of ourselves, participants in the world with other species and other beings of all sorts, non-sentient kinds like rocks. Hold that thought for now, because I want to remind you what you already know, that we live in a very broken and very polarized world and not a world of soaring condors alone or listening to trees or taking the wisdom of rivers. This week, the New York Times had a long piece on the drying up of the Great Salt Lake. And we know, for instance, in the public media about the degradation of forests, which we fear may be uh, almost becoming extinct themselves, particularly in Amazonia. At times we feel we might be bringing the world to the edge of extinction. And certainly that this is some kind of edge. And yet, this is the only moment, this is the only place from which change can come. And maybe part of that renewed theology I'm talking about is that we are stumbling towards something in which we're exploring how to be hopeful, how to be joyful, and how to be purposeful in a broken world. Our commons is despoiled, it's degraded, and yet, I think of Howard Thurman, the great African-American theologian and his acceptance of where we are in this moment, in this place, and what he calls the growing edge. And I don't know if you know that, but his words are here. And this is what he says about the growing edge. All around us, worlds are dying and new worlds are being born. All around us, life is dying and life is being born. The fruit ripens on the tree. The roots are silently at work in the darkness of the earth against a time when there shall be new lives, fresh blossoms, green fruit. Such is the growing edge. It is the extra breath from the exhausted lung. The one more thing to try when all else has failed. The upward reach of life when weariness closes in upon all endeavor. This is the basis of hope in moments of despair. The incentive to carry on when times are out of joint. The source of confidence when worlds crash and dreams whiten into ash. It's an extraordinary piece of writing. It's an edge, as he says, the space of the growing edge might be right at the last minute of where we exist as a human species, and there will always be beauty, and there will always be joy, and there will always be the opportunity to grow. In fact, there's endless possibility. And as Thich Nhat Hanh might have said, but didn't say, that's not a matter of faith, it's a matter of practice. To work at the growing edge, to acknowledge the grief and pain of being close to the edge, and yet to find the sacred there is to practice spiritual commoning, the hopeful sharing of resources, the faith that what we do matters, that all we do makes a difference. When I came to Common Street a couple of years ago, and it's funny because I do feel I know many of you and some of you have taken part in things at Lewisham. So I feel I can be justified in saying when I came to Common Street, I found a community doing real commons work, taking spirituality seriously, committed, diverse, having to sit with meaningful difference. And look, I, I even mean around our COVID experience and our divergent views about that, but loosely held together in a web of connection. And I'm also not being idealistic because I too am a minister and I know the way that congregations work. They're not businesses or communes or political parties. They're very holistic in that they invite us to bring a whole bunch of stuff 
and not all of it nice, because after all, we are all really broken. But they rest and move on the commitment to real change, personal and cultural. And wherever we are party politically, we all believe in the human spirit. So what we're doing here and what I share with you is a growing, a renewed, practical, social, spiritual commons, growing something new at the growing edge, growing a spirituality beyond our old denominations and faith inheritances, a newer religion for new times, reshaping it to be resilient and sustainable and powerful in the times in which we live. We know kindness, compassion, equality and justice all matter. And we know there's more because it matters where our commitment to justice comes from. Not just that it comes from a commitment to human rights, but from the understanding of the vast interconnectedness of all being. I read something by the great long-term climate activist, Bill McKibben this week, probably also in the New York Times. And he said that religion is always, he said Christianity actually, but it pertains to all religion. Religion is much better as a countercultural movement. It's not good when it's on the side of the establishment. What we're here to engage with is the more. Again, something I learned from Jesuits was um, that one of them once said at a conference I was at that, we all want to build the community center. We all want things to be better, but is that it or is there more? It was such a brilliant thing to say. I felt that ever since then I've been looking for the more and that the more is the thing that supports our real energy for change, that gives us sustenance, that supports us in our lives and loves and commitments. It's that that is at the expansive heart of the spiritual commons, our access to, and our personal shaping of it. It's really important for me to say it. It's not just our access to a kind of sense of spirituality and connection, but the way in which we are entitled to and can and will and do shape it. Our access to and shaping of the religious and spiritual, artistic and cultural, political, social resources to which we also contribute, which we generate and which we can harvest and grow. Always now where we are. So much time has passed from this moment. This moment is the first. Amen. Amen.